Well, good morning, everyone. If you would like to grab a seat, welcome to St. John's. Uh, and I'm being pointed at this way to stay right there. Okay, sorry, there's a, there's a camera. I'm not used to that. Over here. So welcome to St. John's. I'm going to stand and sing our first song, which I think is quite appropriate, uh, given the words here. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind, I think, with uh, those of you who haven't caught up with the news. There's been a change of government overnight, and that can bring a lot of anxiousness, joy, trepidation, depending on which side of politics you're on. But remember, the ones, the one, uh, the one uh, constant in all is, is the love of Jesus and our Lord and Saviour. Let's, let's stand and sing our first song. Turn to the person beside you and welcome into the service today. That was quick. You can be a bit more friendly than that. Turn around and say good day to someone behind you. Go on. Very good. Well, a special welcome to any visitors we may have with us today. Uh, great to have you with us and welcome to St John's. Another cold, wet, rainy weekend. There seem to be a lot of those at the moment. Anyway, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's say this general thanksgiving together. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, 
and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Michelle's going to bring us notices. Good morning, everyone. On yet another cold, wet Sunday morning. A few birthdays this week. We have Rose. I think Rose and Victor are away at the moment. Is that right? Um, so it's Rose's birthday this week. If you're in contact with her, send her a quick message. Uh, Cole, uh, who's part of our evening congregation, and Marie. Marie's not here this morning either. Maybe she's watching at home. Happy birthday, Marie. Um, we hope that all of those people have a wonderful birthday. If you see them around, wish them a happy birthday. Uh, today is the day for afternoon tea at Ross and Penny's place. Ross and Penny are here, so if you haven't let them know yet you're, that you're coming, then catch them and, um, after the service and let them know that you will be there. Is that all good, Penny? Anything else we need to know? No? All good. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, you will be inside, funnily enough. What a shocking cold day. <laughs> yes, thank you. You've been inside and warm. Okay. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Peter and I will both be on Zoom uh, at 7pm for anyone who's got any questions about the different things that have happened with General Synod and Synod. So join us on Zoom at 7pm if you'd like to discuss any of those things. And then on Wednesday morning, I will be at Chenzo's from 9.30 to 11.30 uh, for our usual cafe catch-up. So I hope you can make it along and have a cup of coffee with me there and a bit of a chat. Uh, we had a wonderful morning praying yesterday morning for Winterfest and all the different things that are starting to come together for that. It's looking like a wonderful week and a wonderful program. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to pray again, or uh, well, you can pray all week, but pray together again on uh, next Saturday afternoon at 4pm. Uh, so pop that one in your diaries as well. And then next Sunday, uh, we're going to have a combined service with lunch and tr well, training and lunch, the other way around. Um, so we'll be meeting, uh, so there'll be one service next week. It'll be at 9.30. Um, so 9.30 for all the congregations together here, uh, followed by a brief bit of training on a thing called Every Member Ministry, and then we'll have lunch together. Um, I will have... Uh, I, we sent out a sign-up for bringing something for the potluck lunch, um, but I'll have a paper copy at the back after this if you'd like to um, offer to bring something for that lunch. And Daniel is racing up... <laughs> <laughs> is trying to raise up right now uh, to tell you a bit more about Winterfest. See you soon. Good morning, everybody. Those of you who are here at 8 a.m. get to hear this again. You're welcome. Uh, as you're surely aware at this point, Winterfest King of the Jungle is right around the corner. Uh, we've already got some registrations coming in, uh, which is very exciting, uh, and it is also a slightly stressful time as we start preparing. Um, this morning, I'm just here to give you all a bit of a rundown on the teaching that we're doing during the week so that you're informed, so you can, um, your prayers can be informed, so that you know what's going on, so that you're, you're linked in with what's happening during the week, even if you won't be there. So in the teaching on day one, we realize that we need a hero. In the Old Testament, the Israelites are desperate for somebody to take down Goliath, and in comes scrawny shepherd boy David, um, who has a rock, a sling, and trusts in the God that can defeat Goliath. Uh, and then we also meet Jesus in the New Testament, uh, and he's God's promised king, who's the hero for the whole world. On day two, then, we hear of a threat to our hero, both David and Jesus. Uh, and then on day three, that turns into a chase as King Saul pursues David, uh, and as uh, the Pharisees make a plot to capture Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. On day four, though, David becomes king. His kingdom looks fantastic. He's defeating all his enemies. God is with David. Things are looking pretty good. So day four, we're calling success. But then David makes a big mistake, and then he covers, up with, covers it up with a big mistake. So that doesn't look so good. And uh, Jesus is killed. So day four, we're not going to call success. We're going to call it success. But then we go on to day five. Jesus rises from the dead. He offers life and a fixed relationship with God to all who trust and follow him. So day five, we're calling victory. If you're in primary school, you can register now. 
And let me rephrase that. If you're not in primary school and you know people in primary school, encourage them to come along. And if you're not in primary school, then you can be involved in a lot of other ways to help us make the week happen. So there are sign-up sheets in the entryway. Um, you can be involved before Winterfest, during Winterfest, after Winterfest. You get the idea. Uh, if you want to know more about some of the things on those sign-up sheets, then look at the person who's in charge of that area and ask them what's involved. See if you can, see if you can be part of that area. Um, you can also ask myself or Peter or Michelle or anyone who's been to Winterfest before as well. Uh, as Michelle said, join us at our prayer meetings. Prayer is the most important part of our preparation for Winterfest, and so we should all be getting involved in that part. There are prayer sheets at the back from our prayer meeting yesterday, and come along next Saturday as well and pray for Winterfest then as well. Most importantly, the jungle drums are calling. Are you going to join us? Thank you. Jungle drums are five weeks away tomorrow, I think, if I'm correct. So it's getting closer. Gloria is going to uh, lead us in the Bible reading shortly. Before she does, let's say this prayer of preparation together. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Gloria. The reading today can be found on page 60 if you want to follow it in the Pew Bibles. It's uh, Exodus chapter 19, reading from verse 1 to 6, and then we'll go on to verse 20, starting at verse 1. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The, call, the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. 
you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbour's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Gloria. Give me a second. Get all my devices working. Right. That one. There we go. Uh, in case you missed it, uh, there was an election yesterday. If you did miss it, and you're supposed to have voted, and you forgot about that, I have some bad news for you. Um, <laughs> we have a new Prime Minister. Uh, yesterday, or oh, was it yesterday, last night? Was it early this morning? Yeah. Scott Morrison conceded defeat. Um, Anthony Albanese is our new Prime Minister, which leaves us in the place that every election really leaves us. We go into the election hearing a list of campaign promises, and the first question we've got is, I wonder how many will actually be fulfilled? And the other question we come in with is, I wonder what agendas they had coming into this election that they didn't put as campaign promises. Doesn't it, I always find it interesting how often it turns out that one of the big passionate concerns of a party just never gets mentioned when they go into the elections. What we have seen in this election is a reaction against both major parties, with both losing what were expected to be fairly safe seats to independence. Trust seems to be a thin commodity at the moment. We've been hearing about promises as we've been working through the Bible here at church. We've been looking, if you've just joined us, we've been looking at God's big picture, the story of the entire Bible, the rather modest attempt to look at all 66 books of the Bible in one term. And what we've been seeing is a God who makes these incredible promises. But are those promises, just like the promises that we're sitting on at the moment, that we wonder whether they're going to be realised or not? And are there things that God isn't telling us? What kind of leader is God? What does it mean to be under his rule? Because ultimately the Bible says that no matter who you elect to your parliament, it is God who is the king of all kings, the lord of all lords. And I don't know, you go to the prime minister of all prime ministers, we, we can work out that bit, can't we? So this morning as we unpack the scriptures, we're going to see what it means to live under the king who is God. And what it means to have his promises in our ears. So, would you join me as we commit this time to God in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you have given us your word, living and active. And we pray that as we study your word this morning, you would help us to be informed, that we would know about you, about ourselves, about our world, about what it is to be in relationship with you. But Lord, we pray that we would not just be informed by your word, 
but that we would be transformed by your word. Challenged, encouraged, rebuked, and trained. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, this term we are looking at God's big picture at the journey from the pattern of the kingdom that we got in Genesis chapter 1 right through to the perfected kingdom that we get at the end of the scriptures. And we're going to be looking at that journey. Uh, And we're speeding up the freight train as we go through. You might remember in the first week we only looked at two chapters, Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And then in the second week, we looked at one chapter, Genesis chapter 3, and you might have been getting nervous at the rate we were going. Last week, we skipped through a few chapters of Genesis and got all the way to chapter 12. Today, we do the rather ambitious thing of covering Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. So let's start verse... No, what, what I'm actually going to ask is that some of this we're not going to be looking at today, but it, it's covered by this section if you're following through in the book, God's Big Picture. And what I want to encourage you to do is, is to take some time to have a look at that. It, there's parts that talk about that I'm not going to be talking about today that talk about God's promise to Abraham worked out in terms of land... And in Numbers through to Judges, we find God delivering his promise of land and how God's people respond to that promise. And then in Ruth to 2 Samuel and slightly into 1 Kings, we find God's promise of a king. And I want to encourage you, if you want to dig through that, there's a fantastic way to do it quite briefly. Some of us may have done that in our small groups. I know our home group did. We looked at a, a video that's been done by um, Vaughan Roberts, the author of this book. Um, and I want to encourage you to take a look at it. We've sent the link out today as, a, as an email, so you can find that in your email at home and have a look for yourself. For those who are watching online, uh, the link is actually in the description underneath the, the video. So you can jump into that and have a look at God's partial kingdom, place and king. All right, there's my advertisement and now we can move on. Because we're going to be focusing, remember God's promise to Abraham that he, would, that he was to go from the land of his fathers to a land that God would show him, to a new land. That in that land, God would make of him a great nation. And that God would bless him and through him bless all the nations of the world. Those are the important promises that we keep, have to keep remembering The working out of God's kingdom, which is God's people in God's place under God's rule. As I say, God's place and the institution of the kingdom that's associated with God's rule, you can watch and read for yourselves. But today, let's focus in on this promise of blessing. And the promise of blessing becomes a promise of salvation as we read, through, read on from Genesis 12. Genesis 12 was the promises of God and we hear of these promises then being repeated again and again. Abraham has two children and the promise is passed on. But it's not actually promised... The promise doesn't pass on to both the children. It doesn't, promise, it doesn't go to Isaac. It doesn't go to Ishmael. It only goes to Isaac. Again, Isaac has two children and the promise is carried by Jacob, not Esau. Jacob has 12 sons. This is now starting to look like the beginnings of a a nation at least. More than one child is probably a little bit better, isn't it? Now we break out and we've got... uh, 
12 children, Joseph and his 11 brothers. And if you haven't read the story of Joseph, can I encourage you just to pick up Genesis and have a read? It's a great yarn. You could watch Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. They get some of the names right. That's about it. Uh, but, you know, it's got some great songs in it, but really, read your Bible. It's much better. You might remember that Joseph ends up in Egypt through the wicked act of his brothers and through his own arrogance and folly in his dealing with them. And yet God is working his good purpose out to care for his people and to bless them. And as famine arrives, you end up with Joseph who has now become the kind of second only to Pharaoh in Egypt, able to give care for Jacob and his sons and their families to preserve them in Egypt. And that is where we take it up. There's now the uh, children of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, join the 11 brothers of Joseph and you get what are going to be the 13 tribes. 12 tribes, you say? You keep forgetting Levi. And so we come to the book of Exodus. And it is here that God's promises get this note of salvation. Pick it up in verse 6 of chapter 1. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation... But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. That doesn't look like bad news, does it? Here's God's care for his people. We've seen God's blessing. And now this uh, big family has turned into a giant people group. So that the land was filled with them. Now it is a vast number. Here is God's blessing. But now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Remember that word? It's not nice. Shrewdly. It's not a compliment. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. And so God's people are enslaved. And your question as you read is what has happened to those wonderful promises to Abraham? This people who've become numerous, the very fact that God has made them numerous has meant that they're now enslaved. They've gone from being blessed in the land of Egypt to being slaves in the land of Egypt. They've gone from the land that God promised them to a different land. Caught up as slaves there. You see the question that, it ar that arises over God's promises. Is God going to fulfill his promises? Except, of course, God promised this bit too. Way back in Genesis 15... As God is talking to Abraham about his wonderful promises for what will happen to his descendants, he says these words. The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions." And so we get the first part of the book of Exodus which tells us about God who saves, God who rescues. And that that rescue is actually bound to the good promises of God. That the God who says, 
I will give you land. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. Is the God who saves. And we can read in the early chapters of Genesis of God's uh, work in, through meeting with uh, Moses, preserving Moses first, then meeting him and sending him to the people and sending him to, the, to Pharaoh to speak and to demand that Pharaoh release his people and all the plagues and all of that stuff that you can read about. But perhaps the chapter that captures God's saving work here is chapter 14 of Exodus. In chapter 14 of Exodus, this vast people group have been released and are on the run but are being pursued by Pharaoh. And they find themselves caught between the Sea of Reeds. You'll often hear it talked about as the Red Sea, but actually in Hebrew it's the Sea of Reeds. And the entire army of Egypt. Stuck between the two. What will happen? And the nature of God, the nature of the God who promises is then captured in these words from Moses. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. What a wonderful picture. Stop muttering, stop grumbling, just stop and watch because God fights for you. And of course, if you read on, you hear of God parting the sea so that his people can walk through on dry land and then as the Egyptians try to follow God no longer parts the sea and the Egyptian army is destroyed. It's worth noting God parts the sea, not Moses. I just like that cartoon. God saves. Now it's really important that we get this idea because we're about to hear about God's relationship with his people We're about to hear words of God's law. But before we ever get there, God saves. Before we come to the the terms of relationship and the responsibilities of the people of Israel, before we get there, God saves. God who promises delivers and is revealed in how he delivers his promise to be the God who saves. Well, having rescued his people, he gathers them to Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. And we find the creation of an astounding thing, a treaty. In the ancient world, If you were a little nation, usually you found a big nation and you arranged a treaty with them. You would pay them a tribute and if somebody came and attacked you, they would come and defend you. Sometimes it happened in the other way around. A big nation came and conquered you and then said, now I'm going to make a treaty. After all, it's a much nicer bargaining place to work from, isn't it, if you're the big nation? And they might say, well, now that I've conquered you, here's what I expect of you, but here's what I will do for you, and this is what comes with it. And in Exodus 19, we see God entering into a treaty with this people group so that they end up becoming a nation, not just a rabble. Let's pick it up in verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians 
and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Here you get that idea of the treaty, the covenant. Such an important term in the scriptures. Here, this is not like the covenant that God made with Abraham, where God said, this is what I'm going to do for you, and that's the end of it. This is a two-way covenant. This has God's side and their side. And it's important we understand how that works. Because like I said, before anything is said of the side that the Israelites had to fulfill, we hear that God has already done. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. God has already saved this people. God's salvation is not based on their performance. It's not, here's a list of rules. If you can get over 97%, I'll save you. God saves first. The covenant, the agreement God makes with his people is grounded in his saving work. And he promises things to this people. He, he promises them a, a, a particular status. They will be a treasured possession among all peoples. The, God is the creator of all the earth. He is king over all the earth. There is no facet of human existence over which God does not say, Mine. Something worth remembering as we reflect on the results of an election. This has not stopped being a nation under God's sovereignty. No nation gets out from under God's sovereignty. No nation gets to escape the overarching rule of the God of all the earth. All the earth is his. But God tells this people that amongst all the earth that is his, they will be treasured and precious. And that's right, isn't it? Because that's exactly what God promised Abraham. Descendants whom God would bless. So here is a, a, this nation God promises will enjoy his favour and blessing. This nation that he has already saved. And he will give them a status amongst the nations of the world. A beautiful status. They will be a kingdom of priests. The priest was the one who represented God before the people and the people before God. The, the one who brought people before God. That was the job of the priest. And this would be a nation who would bring the nations before the God of all the earth. They had a global role, a global focus. They were to be a holy nation, different, pure, set apart. God's precious, God's own. Holiness is a word that, that means to be set aside as, as special and pure for God. And it's important to realize that holiness is here not a demand but a gift. This is, the thing, this is described as what God is going to do for them. To make of them a holy nation. So what's God's covenant? From his side, it's grounded in his saving work. They enjoy his favour and blessing. They have a global role and focus. And they are set aside as different and pure. That's God's side. What about their side? Well, it's right there in the middle of our verse, isn't it? If you will indeed obey my voice 
and keep my covenant. What's, what's the response of the people? They can't do anything to earn this relationship. God's done all of that. Their job is to keep the covenant. It's to keep faithful. God, the covenant in God, who saves and brings us into a relationship with him that nobody earned, nobody deserved, but that God, by his grace, lavishes on us. That's the picture you get in Exodus 19. And the astounding thing that we find as we sit here today, thousands of years removed from those events, is they're repeated about us. Those promises get repeated about us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter talks about Christians in the same way. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. That's the incredible promise of God. And that makes sense. Because we see that that God who saves and enters into covenant with his people still does. Indeed, his great saving work was not at the Red Sea, but at the cross. And again, based on his already accomplished work, he holds out to us a new covenant where we can know him. A covenant that extends beyond national Israel to those of us gathered here today. Well, this covenant, this treaty in Exodus came with two symbols, two very important symbols. The first of them is actually the law. The law was a gift to Israel. If you don't get that, Read Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. It'll take you a while. And the entire thing is a hymn of praise to God for the gift of the law. Sometimes we have this, I, I don't know, maybe it's that we just don't like being told what to do and our secular mindset just rebels against this one. But ancient Israel got this. The law was a gift, not a chore. And God gives them the law so that they might know him, so that they might know how they, are to, how they can please him. They don't have to just make it up. He tells them. He tells them in incredible detail. He gives a summary of it, and we heard that summary in the words that Gloria read to us. The ten words, as it is, or ten commandments. And that passage in Exodus 20 takes us through the, an overview, in a sense, of, of, of how we respond to a God who has already saved us. And you get those commandments, no other gods, no images, not taking the Lord's name in vain, keeping the Sabbath. All of those first four focus on who? On God. With respect to God... We honour the fact that he is the one who saves. And so we don't, there's no other gods that we acknowledge. Because God saved and has spoken, we listen to his word. We don't go creating images to bow down, not even of God. Because he is the God who saved us and lavishes his favour on us, we don't take him flippantly. We don't take that relationship lightly. This has got something to do with speech, but it's got more to do than, more than speech. It's about how we act. We are people who bear his name. And we're not to do it lightly. It does include speech. When we turned up to vote as we were given our voting papers. Um, some tore off the page and I think they tore a little bit extra. Went, oh, Jesus Christ. 
This is what I want. You know those things where you, th- you, you think of what you should have said later? I wanted, I, when I got home, I thought, I know what I should have said. Yeah, I know him, but I don't think he's turning up to vote today. That's what I would have loved to have said, but I didn't. I wasn't clever enough. Now, we don't take God's name lightly. We don't take a relationship with him lightly. And because he is a God who we trust to look after us, we express that trust in him by not working and squeezing every day until we can get the last penny of income out of it, but by joining him in resting on the seventh day. You could summarize these four commands by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then the next one's honoring parents, not murdering, adultery, stealing, the, the things that, is, that, that we are to withhold, that they're about each other and how we treat one another. That don't abuse each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this idea then comes out in lots and lots of little case laws. What do we do in this situation? Well, how, how do you then apply loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbour as yourself? Well, here's how it works. And we find scattered through the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy all kinds of little case laws. This is what you're to do. that express what it is to love God, not just in terms of honouring God, but also in keeping distinct. Israel's holiness, its distinction from the nations, is part of being God's, is part of honouring God. And so we find some things, some case laws that are about being distinct. You don't mix two kinds of fabric. You don't mix two kinds of crop and your fields. And you don't mix with people from other nations and worship their gods. You remain distinct. Can I say that the laws of the Old Testament are some of the most neglected passages in our Bibles? Or the most misused? They're worth reading. Ask yourself, how does, how, what was this about in terms of loving God, in terms of loving our neighbour? And most of all, how do we as people not under the partial kingdom established at Mount Sinai, but the great kingdom of God established at Golgotha, At the cross, how do we relate to it? The law, a great symbol and gift of this treaty, the second great symbol and gift, was the gift of the very presence of God. And in Exodus 25 to 40, if you've ever read the end of Exodus, you know, you you sit there and you read through all the events at the beginning and it's kind of an exciting story and then you get the, the wonder of the commandments and then you get building instructions. And it can leave you going, oh, well, this is getting interesting, isn't it? Actually, they're really, really, really special. Because that building that consumes the end of Exodus is the building of the symbol of God's presence in the midst of his people. A tabernacle. And the instructions were so detailed that they've been able to go and do that. That's, you can go and visit that. It's a life-size replica of the tabernacle. They're detailed enough that you can do it. And they did it. They built this tent, a tent when human beings could meet with God. God was there in their midst. What a wonderful privilege. And at the end of the book of Exodus, 
We read the most incredible words about this tent. Let, let me read them to you. They're not on the screen. You'll have to listen. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of Lord, the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, wherever, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out, set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. God in their midst, right there with them. It's an astounding thing. A God who entered into a covenant with them. Do you ever wonder why Mount Sinai didn't get treated as this great shrine of of the Israelites, why they didn't keep going back to Mount Sinai for an annual pilgrimage. Because when they left there, God went with them. In their midst. Of course, there's a problem, isn't there? As we hear of this incredible relationship, this incredible covenant of a God who saved them, has given them the law so they know how to please him, has given them his presence right in their midst. What do you do with that when this is the same race that we've been reading about all through Genesis and beginning of Exodus? People who are renowned for doing things wrong. Isn't that what we do? Whether you're talking Adam and Eve, the generation at the time of the flood when God saw that every inclination of their heart was only evil all the time, the generations that followed that proved that the flood generation wasn't that unique, even the people of Israel rescued out of slavery who spent their entire time whinging. How do you relate to a God like that when that's true of you? Friends, uh, I said that the laws in the Old Testament were some of the neglected, most neglected parts. Can I say I think the most neglected book is the book of Leviticus? with its instructions on sacrifices. And friends, I hate to say it, this is where it's all at. This is how God responds to a failed people. How does God enter into a relationship with a failed people? How would, really, how does a holy and pure and righteous God ever sign a covenant with a people like the Israelites? How does God give them laws that they are going to break so often that, you know, you, you're not going to be able to keep up reading the laws for the speed at which they break them? How can they ever meet a holy God and hope to live? How do a defiled people come before a holy God? Well, that's the sacrificial system, isn't it? What does God do? He says this is so that you would know what you need is one to take your place, to bear your guilt, to wear your shame, so that you can be cleansed from it and can approach him with confidence. We talk about this as the partial kingdom. And it's right to talk about it as the partial kingdom because the things instituted there are only partial. They're like that sheet of paper you get when you first get your license that says you've paid the price, you've got a license, here's the number, but you're still waiting on the card to turn up in the mail. It's real, it's legitimate, but it's only legitimate until the real thing turns up. And then you've got to throw it in the bin, don't you? Try driving with that piece of paper once the card's been issued. You're not allowed to. The real thing is, of course, the cross. 
The place where God shows his great relationship with us. The place where God rescues us. But also the place where our sin is dealt with. Where somebody substitutes for us. Taking the judgment we deserve. Wearing the punishment we deserve. It's where God himself deals with our sin by being the substitute for us, Jesus Christ. The nation of Israel is very important to us as Christians. It's why we've got an Old Testament, why we read it, why it's important for us to read. Because here we see God acting out with Israel what his ultimate plan is to act out through Jesus Christ for all the world. God preparing the way for the reality of which the tabernacle was a shadow, the priesthood was a shadow, Moses was a shadow. And we gather today as people on whom all the fulfillment of the ages has come because of Jesus. Apostle Peter, remember his words? As he repeats the great promises of that covenant at Sinai, but speaks them to a people under the new covenant, under the perfect covenant in Jesus Christ, says, you are a chosen race. You, you are a royal priesthood. You are a people for God's own possession. That you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have done, not only for your people in times past, but for us. We thank you that you are a God who saves first who does not require us to have achieved a standard of uh, rightness before you will act, but you act while we were still sinners. Our Lord and God, we thank you that you are the God who takes us and makes us a people, even as you did with Israel, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your treasured possession. May we, resting in your goodness, trusting in your saving work, ever coming to you and acknowledging our need for your forgiveness, may we proclaim the excellencies of you, our God, who has called us out of darkness into your marvellous light. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
seated. Before we can confess our sins to Almighty God, let me read this passage from Joel. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Hebrews chapter 4, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us now confess our sins to Almighty God. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God desires that none should perish but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 6. Christ died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God In Christ Jesus. Chris will lead us in prayer shortly before she does. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, how we praise your name. We thank you that you are the God who speaks. You have spoken throughout all of history. And in these last days, you have spoken to us by your Son, Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, we exalt you as the name above every name, the one who is the radiance of the glory of God, the only one worthy of sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yet, Lord, we admit that sometimes we lose our way and neglect to treat you with the awe and majesty that you deserve. So we ask you to open the eyes of our hearts, not only to the hope to which you have called us, but also to the glory of who you are. Thank you too. You are not only the God who speaks, but you are the God who listens, who listens to the prayers of your children. So we bring our prayers before your throne, confident that you will hear us, and in hearing us, will answer according to your good and perfect will. Father, we pray for the nations. Once again, we come to you asking for your continued mercy on our sinful and messed up world, the world that is so far removed from the perfect place you created it to be. Father, Today we pray for the persecuted church in places like Somalia and Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Egypt and Myanmar. Father, we pray for believers who risk their lives to share the gospel with others. And Father, we know that they ask that we don't pray for their comfort and safety, but that we pray for boldness for them as they share their faith in difficult and dangerous situations. And Father, they ask us to pray that they will not stop sharing the gospel, but that they will remain faithful to you, no matter what the cost to them personally. Father, 
may we learn from the persecuted church that the most important thing to ask for is that the gospel will advance across the world. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, your word tells us that all governing authorities have been established by you. So we pray that you will work through the new government here in Australia. Help those in power, Lord, to make laws that are based on true justice, wisdom and fairness to all. And even as we, as your people, long for peace, healing, hope and Christian revival for our nation. You, Lord, are the one who in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. You are in control of everything. And Father, how we look forward to that day when at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we pray for our church and our community. Father, as we pray for our church, we ask that each of us may not be ashamed to own Jesus as Saviour and Lord in a world that has largely rejected your right to rule our lives. May we all walk closely with you day by day and be given the strength and courage to stand firm in the truth of your word in our church, our homes, our workplaces, our community, and in all our relationships. Father, we pray for our rector, Peter. Father, please give him the wisdom and strength to face all the joys and challenges of the ministry here at St John's and in this diocese. We give thanks, too, for our community chaplain, Michelle, we ask that her pastoral care ministry will be effective both within our church and within our local community. And Father, we pray for our ministry apprentice, Daniel. We pray that as he learns and serves in our church, that he will be faithful to you and your word. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray too, Father, for our community outreach through Winterfest. We thank you that so much planning is now underway. Today we pray especially for Trinity and Dan as they prepare the daily Bible teaching sessions. And we ask that you will inspire them with good ideas that they will engage with the kids every day of Winterfest. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we pray for those in need and we begin by asking for your peace and comfort for those who have suffered loss through the recent flooding events. We pray particularly for people in places like Lismore and Laidley. Lord, we know that they are not just affected by the loss of their possessions and the prospect of starting again, as difficult as these things are, but that many of them now feel traumatised every time it rains. Father, we ask that they will turn to you as the source of all comfort and security and hope. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we also pray for those known to us who are sick or grieving or in any other sort of trouble. And we bring before you Brian, Anita, Janie, Gwen, Fiona and Tim, Miriam, Roz and John, Alan and Yvonne, Elizabeth, Les, Emma and Betty, Faye, Wayne, Lynn T and Jeff, as well as others that we personally pray for. Father, we uphold these people before you and ask that you will bring healing, comfort, peace and strength to them all at this time. 
Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray all these things through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final song together. Crown him with many... May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshipping with us this morning. Have a great week and we'll see you all next week.